Hello and welcome to Serena Speaks and today we're going to go over the first few sections of the BNF which is the guidance on prescribing. Now this section is quite chunky um, so I'll try and go over some of the key points um, over it and signpost you to some of the graphs that are in tables that you really need to pay attention to because there will be some values in there which you'll need to remember for the exam. So if we start off with syringes so an or you can give an oral syringe or you can give a spoon to a patient if you're giving them out a liquid. For example, simple linctus, um, codeine linctus, vulcadine. So in cases where you would need to give them a spoon is if it says take one five more spoonful once a day, take two five more spoonfuls once a day or whatever it is. Basically, if it's a multiple of five, give a spoon. If it's not a multiple of five, give a syringe. And that makes sense because if it says give 3.5 mills three times a day trying to measure that out with a spoon is going to be difficult so in those cases you would give a syringe um in terms of excipients so a lot of products will say or on the prescriptions it will say simple linked is sugar free so what makes something sugar free and what makes it something with sugar well in terms of excipients if it contains fructose glucose or sucrose then it contains sugar. Whereas if it has something like mannitol or sorbitol, then it's sugar free. Now be really careful in questions to read the question carefully, because I remember seeing a question in a past paper um, when I was revising for the exam, and it said, which of these are not sugar free? And I read it as which of these are sugar free? And obviously I got the answer wrong. So just be really, really careful. So something is sugar free, if it doesn't contain fructose, glucose or sucrose. Another excipient to mention is benzyl alcohol. It's alcohol, so don't give it to neonates. And there's another excipient called polyoxyl castor oil. And this is used as a vehicle in injections, um, but it has been associated with severe anaphylactic reactions. So something to be aware of. There's also propylene glycol, and this can cause adverse effects in patients if elimination is impaired. For example, if they have renal failure, in neonates and young children, and in those that are slow metabolizers. Now, the exam could be really mean and ask you, which of these ingredients is a preservative? Which, come on, that's a really mean question to ask. But, just for your own knowledge, typical um, preservatives are, for example, benzalconium hydrochloride and parabens. In terms of something being extemporaneously prepared, Something should only really be extemporaneously prepared if there is no marketing authorization or no product with a marketing authorization um, available. So there's two key definitions that you need to know. There's recently prepared and freshly prepared. And the exam does like to ask definitions. So something that's recently prepared means that it's likely to deteriorate after four weeks when kept at 15 to 25 degrees. Something freshly prepared means that it must be made no more than 24 hours before it's about to be issued. In terms of drugs and driving, in March 2015, the law changed. So because it's a recent change, could be something that they might want to ask. Um, so as we know, with some medicines like opioids, benzodiazepines, it will come with the warning saying this med medication may make you sleepy. If this happens, do not drive, operate tools or machinery. So what the law in March 2015, what it now said it says is, is that if you are driving or you attempt to drive and you have certain um, control drugs in excess, excess being the key word, in excess in your body, you will be guilty of an offence even if your driving is impaired. So those control drugs could include cocaine, ketamine, opioids or even benzodiazepines. Now, however, there is something called a medical defence. And what this states is that patients that are taking those opioids or benzodiazepines and they're taking them at their correct dose in the way the prescriber intended. And if the driving wasn't impaired, then they won't be done for. They're, they're off the hook. They're chilling. But it's really important to make sure that your patients carry around their patient information leaflet or their repeat prescriptions, just in case 
a situation does occur where they get pulled over and then the police can see or they can do their little tests and check that, OK, you have an excess of this in your body. If you have an excess of it and your driving was impaired and you're taking it for recreational users, even if you're taking it for prescription use, but it's in excess, you could potentially be done for. But because of the medical defence, and if your driving wasn't impaired, your driving was absolutely fine, and you're taking it at the dose that was recommended to you, then you're fine, you're chilling, don't worry about it. But this whole medical defence, read, read up more about it. And like I said, because it's something that's quite recent, um, it's a recent law that's changed, it's potentially something that they might want to ask you on. So in terms of EEA and Swiss prescriptions, prescription writing, um, emergency supply at the request of a prescriber and a patient, um, the BNF does explain it, but I feel like personally I found the MEP explained it a bit better. And especially on this section of guidance on prescribing, use your use your MEP um, to support your BNF notes. Um, because as I said, I, I think it just explains it in a little bit more depth and a little bit more detail. And it's actually, I find it's easier to read in there as well. Um, but that's just my personal opinion. And just remember, when it comes to emergency supplies at the request of a patient prescriber, you'll probably be surprised how much of it you already know just by working every day. Um, and know in which situations um, and in which drugs you can give an emergency supply for, how many days you can give a supply for. And when it comes to CDs, what is exempt in being allowed to give an emergency supply? The answer is phenobarbital, but you can only give it for five days. Everything else could give an emergency supply for up to 30 days, unless it's something like a cream or an inhaler or an oral contraceptive, in which case you would give the, well, when it's creams and inhalers, give the smallest pack size, oral contraceptive, give um, a full cycle's worth. Just a key note with um, when it comes to emergency supply at the request of a prescriber, there's three really key dates that you need to remember. There's the date that you supply the medicine, so that will be on the patient's um, label. There's the date that you receive the prescription from the prescriber. And there's the date that's actually written on the prescription. So when you're doing your record keeping and everything, remember to keep in mind there's those three key dates and that's in terms of the request of a prescriber. When it's at the request of a patient though, the only date that you need to really worry about is the actual date that's on the patient label. So the date that you supply that emergency supply to them. And in terms of CDs, have a look at the MEP because they have a great table in there that um, displays all the different categories of CDs, which ones you can give an emergency, which ones you can't give in an emergency, um, which ones you need to keep records for, etc. And it's just a nice, pretty neat table that has all your detailed information in there. So in terms of adverse reactions, it's really important to know in which situations you would need to fill out a yellow card. So this will be for like blood products, herbal medicines, complementary medicines. And for new medicines, they will have a black upside down triangle next to them. And what this means is that these medicines need to be additionally monitored and any suspected adverse reactions need to be reported. And they will be linked with that black triangle for at least five years. It could be extended if required. In terms of established um, drugs and vaccines, we would need to report any suspected and serious um, harm for example, any reactions that were life threatening, fatal, disabling. So examples of these would be like a hemorrhage, anaphylaxis, um, renal impairment, jaundice, severe skin reactions. And that list is really important to remember and to keep in mind. So a really key table that you'll need to learn is the one that's associated with side effects. So the one that says very common, common, uncommon, rare, very rare. And you'll need to know what figures are associated with those terms, because in an exam, they could give you an SPC and they might say to you, which of these side effects is common? Now, when you look at the SPC, it won't necessarily have it nicely written out as very common side effect of this drug is GI distances. Common side effect of this drug is nausea and vomiting. Uncommon side effect of this drug is diarrhea. Instead, it will use those figures. So it will say, greater than 1 in 10 get this side effect, between 1 in 10 and 1 in 100 get this side effect, 
etc. So you'll need to know, okay, greater than one in 10, that means very common. If the question asks for um, which of these side effects it do less than one in 10,000 people get, you will then need to figure out, okay, less than one in 10,000, that means very rare. Okay, let me look at the SPC, let me see where it says very rare, that's what the answer is going to be. So they could give you the figures, they could give you the terms, we just don't know what they're going to give. So make sure you know which figures are associated with which of those terms. And it's actually very easy to remember because it just goes up in 10 every time. So very common is greater than 1 in 10. Common is between 1 in 10 and 1 in 100. Uncommon, 1 in 100 to 1 in 1,000. Rare, 1 in 1,000 to 1 in 10,000. Very rare, less than 1 in 10,000. I'm going to jump over to renal impairment because I think the other sections are really self-explanatory. Um, what I want to mention with renal impairment, though, in particular, is the Cockcroft and Gold equation. Make sure you know that because they won't necessarily give you that in an exam and know what constants um, each of the genders are associated with. So for males, it's 1.23. With females, it's 1.04. Now, I struggle with maths. Always have. Probably always will. And with um, the math section in the exam, the best way that I try to go about with questions is actually trying to firstly figure out what equation they want me to use. And secondly, what units are associated with that equation. Because with the maths paper, they love to just chuck in random numbers as red herrings. So if you can eliminate and work out and figure out, OK, this number's a red herring, it will make your life so much easier. So, for example, with the Cockcroft and Gold equation, I mean, chances are they will just ask you, figure out the Cockcroft and Gold equation for this person. But just in case if they want to be really testing, keep in mind that, OK, I know what the Cockcroft and Gold equation is. I know that it includes weight. So which of these numbers are my weight in kilograms? I know that this question is going to involve serum creatinine. OK, so which of these numbers are my micromoles um, per litre? And I know that my answer is going to have to be in milliliter per minute because that's going to be my estimated um, creatinine clearance. So if you can figure out that, OK, these are the units that I need. And in this question, you can pick out that these are the numbers that are associated with those units. Then you will know that, OK, these are the numbers I need to use. The rest of them are just chucked in there for happy days and it will really, really help you. So with renal impairment, it's also really important to know and remember your table that relates to the degree of impairment and what EGFR values it's associated with. So you have um, you have stage one, two, three A, three B, four and five. So stage one is normal. Stage two is mild. Both three A and three B are moderate. Stage four is severe. Stage five is established. And as I mentioned, know what values they are associated with. Um, and why that's important is because they could give you a value of, say, 25. This person's renal EGFR value is 25. What does that mean? So then you need to remember, OK, value of 25 means it's stage four, which means it's severe. That's just the kind of question they could ask. And actually remembering the values is quite simple because to start off with, just think of your 15 times table. Severe to stage five is less than 15. Stage four would be 15 to 29. Then you've got 30 to um, 44. Then you've got 45 to 59, 60 to 89, and then 90. But if you just remember that below 15, 15, 30, 45, 60, 90, starts off with your 15 times table, then kind of jumps to 30s um, it makes it a lot easier to remember but yeah that's a really really key table to remember because they might want to ask you a question on it in terms of prescribing pregnancy so pregnancy is broken up into three trimesters first second and third first trimester try and avoid taking any drugs try and avoid giving any drugs because that's when teratogenesis is at its greatest risk greatest risk is between third and 11th week of pregnancy in the second and third week of pregnancy, if medication is taken, it could potentially affect the growth and the development of the child, but it's always, always has to be based on a benefit to risk ratio.
if drugs are given before term, so before the baby's about to pop out, um, or labour, then it could potentially have adverse effects on labour or delivery of the new little baby. With regards to prescribing and breastfeeding, it's thought that breastfeeding is preferred to, say, formula feeds because it can provide immunological and nutritional benefits. If a woman is taking medication and she decides to breastfeed, she needs to keep in mind what pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic effects this will have on the infant. So with pharmacokinetic, we mean the absorption, distribution, metabolism and elimination. For example, something like um, fluvastatin, a significant amount of this drug can actually be found in breast milk. Um, if she's taking, for example, phenobarbital, that can inhibit the suckling reflex. Bromocryptine can affect lactation. So again, it's all about benefit to risk value, um, but you will see with a lot of the medication, it will say whether it's suitable or not um, for a woman to breastfeed whilst they're taking that particular medicine. In terms of prescribing and palliative care, what I really want to highlight is morphine. If it says immediate release, that means it's being given every four hours. If it says modified release, that means it's being given every 12 hours. Now, why I want to highlight this is because in a maths paper, they could say um, a patient is on modified release morphine. Here's a bunch of numbers. Um, work out what um, amount the person is going to take per dose. So actually, once you do your calculations, the value that you come to at the end might actually be for 24 hours based on the numbers that they give you, etc. But what the question is asking you is what is being given per dose? So if we know it's modified release morphine, we need to think, OK, it's being given 12, it's being given every 12 hours. Therefore, that value that I'm getting for 24 hours, I'm going to have to divide that by two to get my answer. So see, this is just an example of the kinds of ways where the questions will really be testing to see if you're paying attention to the question, really. Um, and another thing to mention is that they could ask a question about breakthrough pain. So a patient might experience breakthrough pain, particularly if they are in palliative care. And in these situations, you would need to give um, a standard dose of a strong opioid for breakthrough pain at one tenth to one sixth of the regular 24 hour dose. If a question asks for breakthrough pain, majority of the time, um, it's that one over sixth dose of the 24 hour dose that they'll want you to work out, but keep in mind it is between 110 to 16 of a dose. And something like fentanyl sublingual or buccal, that can count and that is licensed for breakthrough pain. And then once a person's um, pain is controlled, then they need to be switched from that immediate release to a modified release. So also with this section, um, with this palliative section, make sure that you know your morphine doses and the equivalent buprenorphine patch doses and morphine doses to equivalent fentanyl patch doses. It would be really mean if they didn't give you those tables in an exam, but we just don't know what to expect. And they could very well ask you to work out a dose of morphine and the next question could be, OK, what's the equivalent fentanyl patch dose of this? So just try and remember those ones. The mixing to mixing and compatibilities. So in general, you would give different injections at different sites and you wouldn't mix them. But in terms of palliative care, you would usually use a syringe driver so you can use mix together different medicines and then give it all in one go to a patient. Um, but they need to be compatible and something like diamorphine, it's a great catch and it's compatible with quite a few medicines which we'll need to know. So, for example, haloperidol, cyclozine, dexamethasone is some of its buddies. They get on well. They can just chill together in a syringe driver and be happy bunnies. Um, because they might ask you a question on syringe drivers and is diamorphine compatible with which of these or which isn't diamorphine compatible with. Um, so learn that list. So another key point to remember is that in terms of dental scripts, make sure that you're familiar with what is in the dental formulary, and which medicines dentists can and can't prescribe. Same with the nurse's formulary, because they could very well show you a picture of a prescription and they might say to you, it's a dental script, 
is this script okay? They'll give you a bunch of answers and the right answer for that question might be that actually, no, this script isn't okay because this particular medicine isn't in the dental formulary. So just try and be aware of which medication they can and they can't prescribe. So that was guidance on prescribing in a nutshell. Now I know there's a lot of sections that I have jumped across and that's because those particular parts are actually really self-explanatory. They're really easy to understand and also trust in your knowledge. For example, the section on oral side effects of drugs. We've seen from other sections that, oh yeah, chlorhexidine, a big side effect of it is brown staining of the teeth. Um, tetracyclines, we shouldn't give to under 12 year olds um, because it deposits in the growing teeth and bones. Bisphosphonates will cause osteonecrosis of the jaw. So we've actually come across these different areas or these particular sections in, in different parts of the BNF. Um, so actually when you go over it yourself and you look at it, you'll think to yourself, oh yeah, actually I'm already really familiar with this. I already know this um, because I've already seen it come up in a different chapter. So I hope you found this video useful. Um, why not give us a like, give us a thumbs up, share, subscribe, visit our Facebook page. And until next time, happy revisings.